this kind of Canada we could build is a future of abundance. It's a future that says the future is better than the past. That's something people like, they can grab hold of. It happens to be true. Right. It happens to be true that we can run our industrial economy better on renewable energy than we can on fossil fuels, but it will take a transition. And that transition will be difficult. It will require effort, it will require capital, it will require focus, it will require political will. Energy exists in the world all around us. It exists in waves, it exists in the sun, it exists in, in wind. It's actually not very high tech to understand there's energy there. All you need to do is understand we're building technologies, engineering machinery to capture that energy. If this was, if this was a picture of North America, it was this big. My little finger, you cover an area with today's solar panel size of my little fingernail, and you would replace all the coal, all the natural gas, all the oil, all the nuclear, all primary energy sources. Now, you need to distribute that energy, you need to store it and make it useful so it's there when the sun's not around, but the point I'm making is there is far more energy available to us through renewables than we'll ever get from fossil fuels. It's just, it's just a different method of capturing it. And three years ago, solar was viewed as a bit of a hippie thing, right? A few nice people put it on their rooftops. There's so much solar going up on so many rooftops now that it's actually threatening the very business model of utilities that used to scoff at solar. So in Arizona, for example, the governor along with the Koch brothers have tried to stop, through legal action, homeowners from putting more solar panels on their rooftops. So there's two different ways utilities can react. They can feel threatened or they can see it as an opportunity to play. Uh, so some take one way, some take another. We're building the next generation of clean tech companies. So these are companies that produce technology that can replace fossil fuels. So not solar farms, but a next generation solar panel. And those three things together, advice, capital, and big partners, help, help move Canadian clean technologies into market. So these are companies like Morgan Solar, next generation energy production. Hydrostore, low cost grid scale energy storage, so you can store the energy when the sun doesn't shine or the wind doesn't blow. Uh, Woodland Biofuels, which is uh, cellulosic ethanol, so you, you produce a gasoline replacement from wood chips. All three of those companies are examples of companies that can compete head to head with fossil fuels that we've invested in, that we're looking to sort of accelerate into the global market to solve this problem uh, before, before it, it gets ahead of us. So one of the biggest challenges we have is, is first it's, it's possible that clean energy begins to compete head to head with fossil fuels. That's happening today. So one might say, well then we've solved the problem, haven't we? And that's not the case. Um, because if you look at the nature of infrastructure, as Vaclav Schmil has argued, it takes between 50 and 100 years to replace an, an old energy system with a new one, even if the new one is better, faster, cheaper. So while clean energy companies are beginning to compete with fossil fuel companies head to head in the market, the market needs to accelerate these technologies or we won't implement that solution in time. The challenge is that infrastructure, right? It's not entrepreneurs like the CEOs of those companies or investors like me or even politicians that decide what kinds of projects get built. The people that decide that are bankers. And the reason bankers decide what kind of projects get built is projects are built on debt. And infrastructure is built on debt, so you need bankers there. And that's what things like the green bond is designed to do. It's designed to shorten the transition between when a technology is able to compete and when its technology risk has been wrung out from an engineering perspective. So an engineer says, yeah, that's gonna work for 20 years. But a banker says, well, I don't believe you. I need to see it work for 20 years. And you want to shorten that gap. And that's what things like green bonds are designed to do, is, is, is step into that void and provide low cost debt at a reasonable rate to next generation companies coming into the space. So remember, victory bonds were sold to you know, win the Second World War. Well, green bonds are like a kind of victory bond for the climate, where you have a government-backed bond. It is sold to the general public, so grandmothers buy them for their grandkids and whatnot. It's a really, it's an interesting feel-good thing, and where you're part of the solution. You're asking Canadians to do something about climate, but you're giving them something to do that's more than changing a light bulb, right? That they can actually buy a climate bond. And that money is raised and used to underwrite the kinds of projects that would open up these renewable resources. 
we're trying to rebuild in a generation something that took five generations to build in the first place. And we're trying to do that in the face of very established, very powerful economic forces that benefit from the existence of that system. So it doesn't make them evil, but it does make them very counterproductive because they are going to fight very hard to continue to reap profits doing what they do. If you made a lot of money yesterday, and you made a lot of money today doing something, why would you change what you do? It's very difficult. It's psychologically difficult. It's difficult from a fiduciary obligation point of view that you're saying to your shareholders, I'm not going to burn those reserves that we found. That CEO will be fired the moment they said that. But if we change the rules of the game, then those energy executives have at least room to move. And executives who figure that out now have kind of a, a, a dual role. One. We can change the rules so they, they sort of have to think about becoming an energy company rather than a fossil fuel company. And two, they're the ones with the capital, the engineering might, the, the market access, because they're big and they're powerful. And that's an opportunity for them. And so I've often tried to position this. It's not us and them, right? The clean tech folks, we're trying to build clean energy technologies that give them an out. There are low carbon energy assets for them to develop. We're coming up with them, we're inventing them, we're patenting them, we're taking the technical risk out of them. But to bring them to market at the $100 billion scale, we need those giant companies. And so I view it not as us and them, but we're enabling a transition for those companies to think about developing low carbon energy assets rather than high carbon energy assets. You can own their solar powers on, on your roof. Communities can own a windmill in their backyard. Germany kind of led this way and it was demonstrated in Germany that, that uh, opposition, for example, to wind farms diminished significantly when communities had ownership in that wind farm. Health complaints disappeared, for example. Suddenly people didn't mind how they looked on the horizon. I find them quite beautiful, but that, that's an aesthetic choice. So I think as more and more people have ownership of energy assets, it's a very democratic way of producing energy. Once you've bought it, there's no fuel supply, right? It's free once you've paid for it. But you also become more literate, not just on climate, because you, you're now part of the solution and you can engage on that mind-bogglingly complex, frightening issue in a way that's substantive. So you become engaged, but you also become engaged in energy. You become literate in energy use. You begin to appreciate what energy is. However, what's new is these technologies are beginning to compete. Morgan Solar will be producing solar energy in the oil-rich Mideast next year at four cents a kilowatt hour. That is the lowest cost energy production of anything I've seen, including the incumbents, including that gas and coal. So that's exciting. But what's also exciting is the market is maturing. So in Canada, more people work for clean tech companies than work for the oil sands directly. It is a larger industry from an employment perspective than the tar sands. And that surprises people. People often think of the tar sands as being this giant of economic activity. It's 2% of our economy, 2%. Now, one of these subsectors of the economy is expanding and one is, is, is not expanding. Uh, I'll let you guess which one. <laughs> if Canada, it's often talked that Canada, we only have 2%. 1.8% or something of global emissions, so why should we make an effort on the climate front? Well, by the same argument, if Canada steps up and gets just our pro rata share, 2% of the global clean energy market, by 2020 our clean tech sector will be bigger than our automotive sector. That's the game we're playing here. That's what's at stake, just from an economic perspective, never mind a climate perspective. And when you think about jobs of the future, these clean tech companies that are mainly small and medium-sized enterprises, so you haven't heard of most of them, but collectively they spend more on R&D than the entire oil and gas sector combined. Right? That monster behemoth industry spends less on R&D than little clean tech. So if you think about next generation jobs and what kind of industry is skating to where the puck is going to be, as Gretzky would say, that's clearly clean tech. That's clearly a sector that Canada should step up and play. Now I think we can get more than our pro rata share of the clean tech market. We are an innovative, resilient, dynamic, well-educated industry. But I think long term there is no other price signal, no other market signal as important as a price on carbon. Until you price carbon, show it's going to be steadily increasing over a long period of time, you don't have the big energy companies, you don't have the big investment houses thinking seriously about this transition. They need to see plain and simple on a spreadsheet that the rules are such that clean energy is going to be more profitable over the long term than the incumbents. And if they don't see that, they won't do anything.
And that's what a price on carbon does. Very clear signal, very long term, that permeates the entire economy. So I think there's nothing more important than that. So imagine a future of, of, of energy abundance underwritten by an economic stimulating rebuild of our infrastructure backed by a Canadian green bond that gets us off a finite resource and onto a technology driven energy system. That kind of future people like and so they're much more likely to engage on the climate issue if you, if you paint that solution at the same time. If you paint that picture and you say, look, we're actually going to make a transition. It's happened before. We transitioned to an information-based economy. We transitioned to an industrial-based economy. And every time that transition occurred, there was some pain, but overall, everybody benefited. It was a boon to society to make these transitions. This transition is like that. It's, it's no different. And I, I know what my grandmother would say to me if, if she heard this talk of this is too hard a problem for us to solve, paying 1% to 2% of our GDP to ensure the planet so it's livable for another few generations. She lived in England in the, during the Second World War, and I know what her generation went through to get us here. So the idea that we can't make an effort on this issue is baloney. Well, I think the important thing for Canadians to keep in mind is that every time the world undergoes some sort of technological revolution, whether it's the Industrial Revolution or the Digital Revolution, if we get it right, if we use our innovation, our well-educated workforce, our venture capital and so on, we benefit from that transition because we ultimately can be supplying the world with this solution. Right? We'll be selling next generation solar technology throughout the world. And that's an economic opportunity that exists independent of how much you want to talk about or get into the climate issue. The world is going to decarbon whether one's denialist uncle cares about it or not. It's happening. And Canada has a choice. We can either jump into that, that opportunity and ensure that we're one of the economies that benefit directly from this transition by being the ones that develop and sell technology, or we're going to be a country that ends up buying that technology from the rest of the world. And I think that's an easy decision for Canadians to make, because I know which side most of, most of my friends and family would fall on.